explosive details of the repurposing of the state security agency. That what Zuma had done to try and establish a parallel news agency. We have an industry-wide problem of trust and credibility. Legitimacy is our currency in the media space, and allegations like this surely put that at risk. Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at The Listening Post, where we dig into the coverage and look at how news is reported. Here are some of the media stories that we're examining this week. Revelations on the news South Africans have been getting. Their government has been paying for favorable journalism. It took four years of imprisonment with no charges laid for Al Jazeera's Mahmoud Hussein to finally be released. What about the others in Egyptian jails? The numbers can lie, especially in the hands of graphic artists who take creative license with the data. And finally, we're all just one Zoom meeting gone wrong, away from a life of infamy online. No authority at all. Just ask the Hanforth Parish Council. For two years now, South Africans have been tuning into the Zondo Commission, a public inquiry into alleged government corruption under the former president, Jacob Zuma. Last month, that inquiry was told that South Africa's National Intelligence Service, known as the SSA, pumped public money into media outlets, paid them under an operation called Project Wave in exchange for favorable coverage of the Zuma government. And this kind of story has a history in South Africa. Back in the 1970s, journalists were being paid under the table by the state to put a positive spin on apartheid, a racist system of white minority rule. That cash for coverage scandal cast a long shadow over South African journalism. A lot has changed since then. This story is about what hasn't, the old habits that die hard. Our starting point this week is Johannesburg. Once again, South Africans find themselves watching an examination of their past through a judicial inquiry, the Zondo Commission. It is led by and named for the Deputy Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. Its mandate is to investigate government corruption, commonly referred to in South Africa as state capture. Former President Jacob Zuma has been ordered to appear and testify before the state capture. President Jacob Zuma has reacted to last week's constitutional court ruling saying he will not cooperate with the Commission of Inquiry into State Capture. Media companies were not supposed to be at the heart of the investigation, but they keep coming up. Former President Jacob Zuma's relationship with the Guptas, an Indian-born family that owned a TV channel and a newspaper, was one of the alleged conflicts that led to the judicial inquiry. Former President Jacob Zuma's involvement in the establishment of the Gupta News Channel was verbally alleged by Sundaram at the inquiry. Into the commission has since heard allegations that the government pumped money into another major media conglomerate in exchange for favorable coverage disguised as journalism. About $1.3 million US that the Zuma government funneled through its spy agency, the SSA, under an initiative called Project Wave. 7.12 Project Wave, would you tell the chair what that project involved as far as you learned? Project Wave took place in 2016, 2017. At that time, Jacob Zuma's presidency was very much in danger. They were enveloping scandals about his relationship with the Gupta family. The so-called Gupta leak emails showed the way in which a private family had allegedly captured large swathes of the Zuma administration for the benefit of themselves financially. So there was really a wave of negative uh, coverage. We were told that this project involved infiltrating and influencing the media in order apparently to counter bad publicity for the country. And so, like anyone in brand trouble, he would have needed positive messaging within the media to try and prop up the Jacob Zuma that won the political battle inside the ANC and who managed to campaign on a ticket of pro bottom up economic interventions that will ultimately benefit millions of black South Africans on the margins of society. So if Jacob Zuma ends up being a criminal, the worst for the people of the country, sir. then of course his entire political biography crumbles in that moment. What is the name of the agency? Uh, the agency, we were told, is Africa News Agency. 
the African news agency that was formed and so on, is, is not really trusted. They, the, uh, the, the Iqbal survey, the owner who bought out the oldest newspaper company in Africa called the Independent Group, he's changed it uh, remarkably already. So uh, it's seen as an art piece for one faction of the ruling party, the Zoom, Jacob Zuma's faction. So the fact that they did this certainly takes it to a new level. The Zuma government, which came to an end in 2018, helped get Iqbal Survey into the media business in the first place. Survey is a medical doctor turned entrepreneur, a rich man with diversified holdings. In 2013, the government loaned him $75 million to buy the independent media group from its Irish owners. That investment was sold to South Africans as part of a wider strategy to introduce more black ownership into a media landscape that was overwhelmingly white owned. A stream of new black editors and reporters were hired at the company's newspapers. Many whites were dismissed, others quit. The editorial tone changed as well, with coverage far more friendly to the ruling ANC party under then President Zuma. Fast forward six years. Uh, businessman Iqbal Survey has defended the PIC's multiple investments in his companies. Numerous investigations have alleged that Survey has asset stripped independent media, and the government under Zuma's ANC successor, Cyril Ramaphosa, is trying to claw its money back. I am being persecuted because I dared to buy a media house. Which begs the question. Was its original investment a necessary act of social transformation in the media sector, or just another example of state capture? There was a genuine desire to produce copy in which more South Africans can see themselves when they open the newspapers. Some of the critics, in my opinion, are beneficiaries of traditional hegemony within the South African media space, racially and in class terms. So along comes this businessman he changes the dynamic of the newspapers because it challenges those of us who are settled in our middle-class worldviews. From a transformation point of view, it looks good, and by all accounts, it is good, you know, but you're conflating this with a owner or a company which is seen to be going rogue, basically. So those are the concerns. So you don't get a sense that this is being done in the genuine sense of transforming the industry rather than in satisfying an agenda of an owner. Survey's news agency admits to taking the SSA's money but denies acting as a front for the government, saying it just focused on more positive stories. Native protest flared against apartheid. In South Africa, the cash for friendly news coverage angle has a disturbingly familiar ring to it. When the rioting ended and peace was restored, 100 blacks and six whites had died. Back in the 1970s, the apartheid regime was up against rising international criticism. Prime Minister B.J. Forster, who as Justice Minister had overseen the jailing of Nelson Mandela, knew that his government could not win the information war in a fair fight. So he resorted to some dirty tricks, funded by the taxpayer. Money budgeted for the military was surreptitiously diverted to the intelligence service, which started a new newspaper in South Africa, The Citizen. That paper is still in print. At the news outlets it could not control, the government searched for journalists it could, paying them off, bribing them in exchange for favorable coverage. By 1979, the scheme had been exposed by South African reporters who were not on the take. Forster was among the many politicians who then resigned in disgrace. Now bear in mind, this is in the 1970s. 1976 is when the Soweto uprisings happened. The vision of a young Hector Peterson being carried dying by his friend dominates um, global headlines. People become aware in sickening detail about the way in which the lives of black South Africans are just being destroyed by the apartheid state. So the use of you know, state resources, taxpayers' money to try and create a contra-narrative that undermine these very 
horrific realities that black South Africans were experiencing was, was you know, a kind of substantial indication of how truly desperate the apartheid state was. And it was based on the same principle. We need positive news. We're not getting fair treatment. People attack apartheid unfairly on doing things really constructive in the interests of black South Africans. So we need to get positive news across about South Africa and our apartheid policy. And you see the same thing being done by Jacob Zuma. When apartheid ended, South Africa went through an exercise in restorative justice, a truth and reconciliation commission that documented the human rights crimes committed during that era. But the commission never revealed the identities of the journalists who took the money. So innocent reporters ended up staying. Reputations suffered. If the country's news media are to have their credibility restored, then more contemporary crimes against journalism must be documented and dealt with. The Zondo Commission will have to name names. Knowing which journalists sold out, exactly who put their independence and objectivity on the market is the place to start. We need to see the paper trail so that we can know which journalists and which media houses were involved, to what extent. Aye, 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 aye. So that we can satisfy ourselves and understand and actually literally to read our industry of the roads. So that becomes an important point for the entire media industry in South Africa. This past week, Egypt finally released Al Jazeera journalist Mahmoud Hussein. He had spent four years in prison there. No charges were ever laid, no trial was ever held. Johanna Hoos has been following the story. Joe, this is welcome news. I guess the question is, why now? Well, Richard, this probably has a lot to do with the recent rapprochement between Egypt and Qatar, the state that funds Al Jazeera. Now, Mahmoud Hussein, an Egyptian that works for the network's Arabic language channel in Doha, was arrested back in 2016 when he flew back home to Cairo to visit his family. And he was accused of uh, disseminating false news and receiving funds from foreign authorities to defame Egypt's reputation. Now, these are allegations that both Hussein and Al Jazeera have always denied. But here's the thing, he was never formally charged with a crime. Instead, his pre-trial detention was renewed over and over again, and he spent a lot of that time in solitary confinement. Al Jazeera has always lobbied for his release, and in a statement, the network said, no journalist should ever be subjected to what Mahmoud has suffered for these past four years for merely carrying out his profession. He was robbed of four years of his life and deprived of his fundamental rights. Al Jazeera's campaign to have Hussein freed was supported by journalists the world over, but press freedom advocates still have a lot of work to do in Egypt, don't they? That's right. Uh, according to the New York-based Committee to Protect Journalists, the CPJ, nearly 30 journalists are still behind bars in Egypt. And just to give you a sense of how arbitrary some of these arrests are, well, in 2019, freelance journalist Solafa Magdi, her husband, Hossam Al Said, and their friend, Mohamed Salah, were all arrested on accusations of joining a terrorist organization and disseminating false news. These are charges that they all deny and that human rights organizations have called trumped up. Now, 10 years ago, the Arab Spring was unfolding. Hopes were so high for a new era of political openness, media freedom, especially in Egypt, given what happened in Tahrir Square. Things didn't work out that way, though, did they? Not at all. Those hopes have been completely shattered. Uh, in 2013, the CPJ moved Egypt into its top 10 list of the world's worst jailers of journalists. And since 2015, it's been in the top three. Nearly all of the media in Egypt, and especially TV, have been brought to heel by the government of Abd al Fattah al Sisi. Um, and for those reporters who do still produce meaningful journalism, well, the threat of intimidation and arrest is very real. Okay. Thanks, Joe. We live in an age of digital data, numbers, statistics, and that's seldom been more obvious or important than during this pandemic. Just think of how much time you've spent over the past year looking at infection rates in your country and others, calculating the risk, trying to figure out where this virus is going. Journalists, researchers, and policymakers are all trying to find better ways of visualizing that data, turning it into graphics that people can understand. Those COVID maps, charts, and trackers, not all of which stand up to scrutiny. 
On the surface, data visualizations seem to say what they mean. They are presented as objective statistical snapshots of reality. Sometimes, though, the truth is more complex than that, and the certainty that we crave eludes us. The Listening Post's Tarek Nafa now on the glut of data that's out there, the flawed numbers, and how we see them. Let's take a look now at the numbers. Charts and graphs have taken centre stage in the reporting of this pandemic. All those COVID maps and graphics reveal patterns that shape how we see and respond to the virus. Well, now we finally have the data. But the data does provide us a ray of hope. The numbers were expected to go up as you... The World Health Organization runs a virus tracker, as does the New York Times. But the source that is more widely cited, more widely seen, emanates from just outside Washington, D.C. The COVID-19 dashboard created at Johns Hopkins University. We try to make all of our data publicly available. And so it sits in repositories that really power the maps and the charts and the graphs that anyone can tap into. Let's start with the numbers, as we often do, Johns Hopkins University. So while we have, you know, a billion page views on our own analysis, we have billions of calls to the data because it's being used in all kinds of different visualizations outside of our own ecosystem. What it's telling me is that in these acute moments in our collective history, we need structures in place where people feel like they can go and get trusted information. A really big spike happening. Johns Hopkins is a trusted source. And in this pandemic, it's data that drives the story. So I wanted just to look through some of the, the data. Data explains the need to flatten the curve. Flattening the COVID-19 curve. You have likely heard the phrase flatten the curve used. It determines when governments lock down. The more contagious variant of the coronavirus is on the rampage. Or how far you should keep your distance. At least one meter. And there's a reason why visualizing all that data makes it easier to understand. If you're a visual learner, a chart or a graph can be a really, really helpful way for you to access information. If you speak English as a second language, if you struggle with language, then that chart and graph can make the information more readily accessible. When it comes to COVID, it's not a case of just knowing the information right now. It's about remembering the risks when you're out shopping and you're trying to understand how close to stand next to someone. It's information that we have to use again and again and again. We create visualizations when the goal of our communication is to let the reader of that visualization see patterns and trends that hide behind numbers. But one of the main challenges in communicating data is not even the visualization of the data, it's for the public to understand that numbers are always uncertain, always temporary, always subject to change, to update, to improvements, and we should never assume that a number captures reality in all its um, uh, nuance and in all its uh, detail. That's because visualizations like the data behind them are never neutral. Human decisions influence how data is collected, depicted, and interpreted. Alberto Cairo wrote the book on this, How Charts Lie. Much of the problem, he argues, has to do with how people misread charts, an impulse you can curb by being better informed and more careful. But there are other ways that charts can deceive. For example, um, the axis of a graph. Uh, we think about bar graphs or line charts or uh, graphics visualizations that are created over a horizontal axis or a vertical axis. It is very easy to manipulate those axes to exaggerate the differences between things or minimize the differences between different things. One of the examples that I describe in, in how charts fly is how some uh, climate change deniers a manipulate a temperature, historical temperature charts to prove, quotation marks in there, that the increase in global temperatures in the past 150 years is not such a big deal. They create a graph in which the vertical axis goes from zero degrees to 100 degrees Fahrenheit. And then obviously the line in the middle is completely flat. Now what they forget on purpose, I believe, is that a tiny increase, two, three, four, five Fahrenheit degrees, could be the difference between an ice age and the world burning in flames. 
The way data is framed or manipulated can dramatically alter how we perceive it. In their rush to turn data into information, some news outlets have also got it wrong. This chart from early in the pandemic compares the death rate between seasonal flu and COVID. There's nothing wrong with the data here, but the vertical axis is off. It has a maximum value of 6%. Once you change that to 100%, a more accurate rendering of the data, it looks a lot less alarming. And for a masterclass in how not to present data, look no further than the British government, whose COVID briefings are so confusing, it makes you wonder if they even understand their own data. Welcome to the latest number 10 press conference. The UK government briefings basically consist of an onslaught of charts and weird kind of infographics, a lot of the information that's disseminated in these like garish colours and small fonts that are basically impenetrable. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. And as the slide shows... I would say that they are almost so bad that it feels almost as if it's intentional. I think there is an effort from some governments to deflect responsibility from the government back over to the citizens. Mona Chalabi's hand-drawn illustrations speak to people in a visual language they can understand. Chalabi's work is subjective and unapologetically so. Visualizations that challenge you to change your behavior or change how you think. They tap into a rich history of data graphics that have tried to highlight injustice or upset the status quo. Among them, Florence Nightingale, who used data to campaign for improvements in the health of British soldiers in the mid-19th century, and W.E.B. Du Bois, whose arresting visualizations in 1900 exposed the disparities between black and white Americans. These graphics channel the persuasive power of visualizing data. One chart that I made, which was about the racial disparities in COVID, felt really, really important. There was this rhetoric about we're all in this together and we know scientifically that's not really the case we know that certain communities are far more vulnerable than others based on historic injustices and inequality um, and it just felt really really important to be able to dispel that myth and the covid symptoms chart i made quite early on during the pandemic like so many of my graphics it also has a little element of levity which is really difficult to do when it comes to covid right like there's not much space for humor when we're talking about a disease that is killing hundreds of thousands of people but i do think that that levity again is really really important for making sure that people don't look away visualizing data helps us to see things more clearly sometimes it's better to let the graphics do the talking in a time of anxiety, of failed leadership, it's tempting to think that there is salvation in the numbers. But having faith in science also means recognizing the nature of uncertainty. Numbers are never permanent. Hans Rosling, in one of his books, he says, we cannot understand the world uh, without numbers but we cannot understand the world with numbers alone. So data visualizations are, you know, some of the best tools that we have to understand the world if we use them well and we interpret them well. But that doesn't mean that those numbers are the whole story, right? We also need to use logic and scientific reasoning. You don't need the numbers, just look at that red line. We'll go back and we'll monitor this period of time for, you know, decades where we'll get a clear view of the truth, but in any of this work, because it's so raw, because it's so new, it is impossible to have absolutes. And so while our systems did fail us in many ways in the last year, I think that the ability to be able to get this information out there to influence behavior and to influence public policy has been one of the bright spots in the public response to the disease. And finally, thanks to a weird confluence of events and technologies, this pandemic, life on Zoom meetings, and the Internet's taste for drama and the absurd, we've come to know a little too much about a small town in the northwest of England called Hanforth. 
The Hanforth Parish Council is the local administrative body there, so it holds meetings about stuff like rubbish collection and parking permits. How do we even know this? Because of a certain viral video of the council's planning committee, a Zoom meeting it held back in December, which has since emerged on social media. This meeting had everything. Power struggles, allegations of authority abused, threats of a municipal coup in a town of 6,000 souls. You could cut the tension with a knife or just cut it into a fake movie trailer, which is what the comics at Spoofed UK did. We'll see you next time here at The Listening Post. Meeting called by two councillors. And we be assured that we won't be thrown out of the meeting like we were last time. That's a point of order, Chairman. That's a point of order. It wasn't you who quoted a point of order. Where's the Chairman? I don't want a turf war breaking out. Up there like a laughing hyena. There's a Chairman already installed. Stop talking! The chairman who hasn't held a meeting since March. Just kicked him out. Where's the Chairman? Please refer to me as Britney Spears from now on. They don't know what you're talking about. I take charge. You have no authority here, Jackie Weaver. No authority at all. There's no way of stopping him calling himself Clark.